Good morning again. Turn to Matthew chapter 15. We are back in Matthew. Chapter 15, starting in verse 29. All right, Matthew 15, starting in verse 29. And departing from there, Jesus went along by the Sea of Galilee, and having gone up to the mountain, he was sitting there. And great multitudes came to him, bringing with them those who were lame, crippled, blind, dumb, and many others. And they laid them down at his feet, healed them, so that the multitude marveled as they saw the dumb speaking, and the crippled restored, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they glorified the God of Israel, and Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the multitude because they have remained with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not wish to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, Where would we get so many loaves in a desolate place to satisfy such a great multitude? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven small fish. And he directed the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fish, and giving thanks, he broke them and started giving them to the disciples, and the disciples in turn to the multitude. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, seven large baskets full. And those who ate were four thousand men besides women and children. And sending away the multitudes, he got into the boat and came to the region of Magadan. This is the word of God. Let's go to prayer. Father, thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that we can come together to learn more about you, to study your word. Father, give to us wisdom. Reveal your truths to us. I pray that you would speak to our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So this study is entitled, Jesus Came to Seek and Save. So, brief recap, uh, the last time we were in Matthew, we talked about the Syrophoenician woman, or the Canaanite woman, uh, and how she came to Jesus and asked him to heal her daughter who was demon-possessed, and Jesus seemingly responded in a rude way and said, uh, you know, first, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel, and she continued to pursue him and said, Lord, help me. And he said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Nice response there. Not one we picture of loving Jesus. And then her response. Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Jesus responded, O oh, woman, your faith is great. Be it done for you as you wish. At that point, Jesus was up in the, the region of Tyre and Sidon, which, if you can see from the map up there, you might have to turn to your Bibles to actually see, uh, it's quite a ways above Galilee. This is actually into uh, more of the Gentile region. And so Jesus was up there, hence the reason the Syrophoenician woman came to him. She was a Gentile, uh, and she, she begged for him to help her. And then, as we read in other locations, we kind of follow Jesus around this section. So he moves from Tyre or, and Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee again, across the Sea of Galilee into another region that also borders and enters into the Gentile land. And then he comes back and goes across the Sea of Galilee again. And so thus was his zigzag across that area. Just as a side note, feeding of the 5,000 was located in Bethsaida. Bethsaida is, if we were to zoom in on the Sea of Galilee, is a little ways down to the kind of a southwest, western side of the Sea of Galilee. And the reason I bring that up is because there are some people who say, well, this event of feeding of the 4,000 is the same as the feeding of the 5,000 which if you look at it logically, that doesn't make sense because we just read in 
chapter, was that 14? About the feeding of the 5,000. And so why repeat that same story again? Uh, then we come to not only the location differences, but note even the leftovers, the amount of leftovers were different in this scenario than they were from the feeding of the 5,000. The feeding of the 5,000 had 12 baskets full of leftovers. This only had seven. Again, just to bring up the fact that these were two different scenarios. And you might think, okay, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, after all, Jesus did heal people multiple times the same way. He would heal lots of blind people, lots of lame people, lots of demon-possessed people, just kind of the same thing over and over again. So surely this must be just another incident like that. In fact, some commentators have gone so far as to say, as I was looking up some more information about this, short little blurb, uh, I've already commented on the feeding of the 5,000. I need not comment more on this section. And on the surface, it does seem to just kind of be another event. You just kind of shrug your shoulders and go, okay, fed more people. But this is actually very significant. So as we talked just a second ago, And what helps, by the way, is if you read some of the parallel Gospels, you'll start noticing these little areas on the map pop out. That then Jesus went to this spot, and then Jesus went to this spot. And as you're just reading through, you go, okay, I have no idea where that is, and okay, whatever. And you kind of move on. But if you stop and actually look at the map, again, you can actually trace his movements, and he's zigzagging back and forth all across this area up here. So first... Tyre and Sidon, Matthew 15, 21, and in Mark 7, 24. Across the Sea of Galilee to Decapolis in Mark chapter 7, verse 31. Decapolis, by the way, is a region that's off near Capernaum over there, off to the right-hand side. Back to the Sea of Galilee. So as he went back to the Sea of Galilee, this is where we find ourselves now. He stops at a mountain. And then eventually... He's going to, as we read at the very end of this chapter, he would head to the regions of Dalmanutha, if I could pronounce that correctly, via the Sea of Galilee, and he would end up in a town of Magadan. So he would hit the Sea of Galilee again, and he and the disciples would go across the Sea of Galilee to the town of Magadan. That's in 1539. So again, these areas, what I should have done is brought up the, the territories map. So you could have actually seen that as well. Because the territories listed show that Jesus, at the very least, if he was not in Gentile territory entirely, he was certainly bordering on the Gentile territory. Hence the reason, again, for the Phy Syrophoenician woman who comes to him. And also, as we read here, uh, and we'll, we'll touch on a little bit later, the people make a comment that's very interesting. So that's kind of the, the geography of the area and a brief history thus far. I always like to say there are no accidents, uh, certainly not with God. God has a purpose for everything he does, and Jesus most certainly had a purpose for everything he did. And this made me stop for a moment as I did this study. And I even began to wonder, okay, you know, Jesus and his family lived in the area of Nazareth, which is, well, how do I the map back up there? It's in the northwestern part of Israel, again, near Gentile borders. Why did they live there? As we're told in the Gospels, it was to kind of further themselves from Herod's region. Okay, well, that makes sense. But at the same time, they didn't need to stay there because after the one Herod was dead, the second Herod really could care less. So why stay so far away? And certainly, the God who had enough power, Jesus who is God, had enough power to stop the multitudes from stoning him to death when he 
proclaimed aloud that he and God are one, surely they would, God had enough power to pretty much live anywhere within Israel that he wished without being molested in any way, shape, or form. Why Nazareth? Why did Jesus spend so much time around the area of Galilee? And why did Jesus travel to the places he did? Was it all coincidence? And why should we care about the 4,000? Just as we care about the 5,000, Jesus said. Again, Jesus had a point and a purpose for everything he did. Each time, as you read through the Gospels, keep in mind, each time Jesus went someplace, it was because he had an appointment with somebody or some group of people. They didn't know he had an appointment with them, but he still had an appointment. He had an appointment when he went up to Tyre and Sidon. Again, an odd area to go to when he had all of Israel to walk around. To go up to that area and to be confronted randomly by a Syrophoenician woman who needed his assistance. And their strange, seemingly strange interactions. Again, there is, there is a point and a purpose to everything that God does. So again, the region where Jesus was feeding the 4,000 was near the land of the Gentiles. Much different from where he fed the 5,000, which was in the land of Israel. We read in Isaiah 55. I'm going to read Isaiah 55, 5 right now. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know. And a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. The feeding of the 5,000 were Jews. The feeding of the 4,000 included Gentiles. He fed Gentiles. This is kind of a sneak peek will, into the plans of God. God intended to include the entire world into his plan. So as we read in verse 29, Jesus departed from there, there being the far right region of the map when I had it up there. Jesus departed from there and went along by the Sea of Galilee in that region. Having gone up to the mountain, he was sitting there. Jesus goes to a mountaintop. He he would oftentimes go to a mountaintop to preach, to teach. That was a good spot to go because logically, on the slant of a hill, if you have the teacher at the top, Everybody is sitting below. It's kind of this amphitheater type effect in the sense that, or rather, kind of like what I'm doing now. I'm up here on a stage talking to you who are sitting down there. It allows you to hear and to see better. And so when Jesus would talk, everybody was able to see and hear. It is kind of interesting, as I was going through Scripture, to note how much God likes to refer to mountains in Scripture, especially in Isaiah. Mountains are often a place of refuge. Mountains are often a place of strength. Again, just because of their their geographic plane where you have one person who holds the high ground. And so mountains have an image of strength as well. The mountain of God. Think back to when Moses went up to the mountain, uh, went up on the mountain of God to talk with God. God was on top of the mountain. And so the people from the surrounding area heard about Jesus being there. They brought their sicknesses, ultimately their hurts, to the feet of Jesus. And they were amazed at how God brought healing. But then note an interesting comment in verse 31. 
so that the multitude marveled as they saw the dumb speaking and the crippled restored and the lame walking and the blind seeing. And they glorified the God of Israel. We wouldn't need to say that if this was Israel we were dealing with. These were Gentile people who were now glorifying the God of Israel. It gives you an idea of the mix of individuals who were there. As a side note, I I noted how compassionate God is. Verse 32, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the multitude because they have remained with me now for three days, have nothing to eat, and I do not wish to send, send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. These people had been hanging around Jesus for three days, listening to him talk, being healed, just experiencing Jesus to the fullest for three days. Most of them probably brought food because if they were move, if they were going from their hometown in the surrounding area to where Jesus was at, it was a remote area as we, as we read here. They probably brought some provisions with them just as the disciples did. That was common. But they had reached a point to where their provisions were low or expended. It was time for them to go home. And Jesus said, I do not wish to send them away hungry, lest they faint on a way. In one sense, that kind of has a double meaning as well. Physically, most assuredly, he does not want them to get hungry and faint along the way, but also spiritually. He was there to feed them spiritually. God knew how much food they had brought and how much they probably didn't fully plan to be there as long. He also knew how much food the disciples had. Later on, we read they only had a few loaves. That was all they had left. I mean, considering there were 12 disciples and Jesus and any other disciples and women who were following, a few loaves doesn't go very far. It gives everybody a little scrap. So everybody was getting low on food. where God makes much of little. So seven loaves and a few small fish are all the disciples had with them. And again, the small fish, they were usually kind of the perch-sized fish that were caught. Uh, They would be salted and or dried. So you had fish jerky and some old loaves of bread. Hard sack. Yum. Certainly not enough for themselves, but most assuredly not enough for so many people. Over 4,000 people were present. And Jesus said, what do we have to give them? And the disciples responded in verse 33, where would we get so many loaves in a desolate place to satisfy such a great multitude? Now pause there for just a moment. We just went through this in chapter 14. You'd think that the disciples would maybe even mid-sentence pause and go, wait a minute, I think we just did this. Such is the case of unbelief. When we don't fully trust God, this is the sort of thing that happens. I like Spurgeon's quote. Faith fosters every virtue, but unbelief murders everyone. It's hard to move forward in your walk with Christ when you're constantly checking to see if, God, this is... Are you sure? Really? Do we have to go this way? To pick on my kids a little bit. Anytime I say, okay, let's go go over here. And I get the, oh, man, do we have to? Why do we have to go over there? It slows the process down, at the very least. God will have his way, but a lot of times we like to drag our feet and slow the process down. 
We show our unbelief. We resist. We doubt. But God is gracious and patient. When the disciples made the comment, you know, where would we go to get you know, so many loaves to feed so many people? This is a desolate place. They estimate, by the way, that uh, the feeding of the 5,000 was done in spring because there was grass that was mentioned. Uh, here, it's, uh, the way it's discussed is if the ground was dry, and so it would be more summertime, so it would be hot. Uh, there wouldn't be much in the way of even refreshing ground to rest upon. So there was literally nothing. Then Jesus asked the question in verse 34, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven and a few small fish. And he directed the multitude to sit down on the grass. And he took the seven loaves and the fish, and giving thanks, he broke them and started giving them to the disciples. And in turn, the disciples gave them to the people. So God provides, he makes much out of little. Again, oftentimes when we mistrust God, when we don't rest in him fully, it makes moving forward very uncertain and uncomfortable because we feel like, Lord, you know, <laughs> I can't fully control the situation. I'm going to do my best, but I can't fully control the situation. And in reality, all we have to do is trust God. As he gives us the command, move forward, trust me, rest in me. I will take care of the ultimate outcome according to how I want it to be. And then we come to the verses where God provides. Verse 35 and 36, the people sat down, prayed, and began to distribute the food. I have to admit, it would be... <laughs> It, it would have been amazing to see that happen, but it would be even more interesting to watch the disciples' responses as Jesus was handing out food to them. It, was that in the, in the form of baskets? I would assume it was a large quantity of food because he had 12 people to hand food out to, and there were over 4,000 people. So everybody closes their eyes and bows their head. We go to prayer, and then as we open our eyes, Suddenly there's enough food to, yes, take this, this basket, you take this basket. <laughs> Was there a gasp of amazement once again? I know for sure that they didn't just go on as if, oh yeah, this is just a normal occurrence. It's like going to the refrigerator. In verse 37, it says, And they all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, seven large baskets full. Those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. Note how it says, and they were satisfied. It said that also when it talked about the 5,000 who were fed, that they were satisfied as well. They ate until they were satisfied. God doesn't do anything in half measures. And we can be satisfied in Christ. Nothing else in this life gives us such fulfillment as walking with Jesus. Isaiah 55, 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. And in Psalm 107, 9, For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. And then in John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This is really the point of this account. Jesus is the true bread of life. 
And that was the purpose of him being there, was to bring the bread of life to the people. Jesus came to seek and to save people. He didn't just come to random places and to random people. And it seems that way sometimes as you read through the Gospels. It seems like, okay, well, Jesus is just kind of walking around, and people would just, like a magnet, be drawn to him. And he would just, yeah, you know, just kind of dispense his, his goodness along the way. And most assuredly, people did flock to him once they found out he was there. Wherever he went, he drew a crowd. But again, let's not be distracted by the fact that a crowd could naturally form around Jesus by the fact that God specifically went to locations to see specific people. As it says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Jesus was actively reaching out to people. Again, the symbolism of Jesus providing bread from heaven was him providing himself. That was the best part of those three days. Surely, being fed with the bread from heaven was amazing, but being with Jesus for three days should have been the best part. Unfortunately, many of the people, including the disciples, kind of missed some of that. It's too easy for us to get focused on life, to get focused on religion, doctrine, and even just reading the scriptures, because that's something we're supposed to do every day. We were talking today in Sunday school about uh, what it means to be born again. What does that look like? And as discussed, it's very easy to do what you're supposed to do to be obedient, but to not have your heart in the obedience, to miss the relationship aspect with Christ. And this is what I was convicted of this week as I read through the section of Scripture. I saw God's great mercy as he reached out to not only the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. He didn't have to do that. He could have waited until after he was raised from the dead, you know, to, to even bother with the Gentiles, to even bother with the Samaritans, to, to, to even bother with the Syrophoenician woman. I mean, he stated he came to the Jews first, but yet such is the heart of God. It is to bring people to himself. As it said in Isaiah, a people whom are not called, will come to me. In other words, people outside of Israel are going to come to me. I'm going to call to them and they will come. Jesus talked about uh, two flocks. There's another flock that I'm going to bring to myself, referring to the Gentiles. God has a heart for people. So that was what was revealed in this section as, as I studied. God has a heart for people. He was seeking people actively, reaching out for them. Not only to heal their temporary sicknesses and ailments, but to actually give them life. To give them the true bread of life. Not just to satisfy their bellies for a time. Because after these people ate, they ate and were satisfied. The next day they were hungry again. The next day they were thirsty again. And so the cycle goes. The people Jesus healed. Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. Unfortunately, he had to die again. Kind of sucks for Lazarus. These people whom Jesus healed from sicknesses does not mean that they were immortal. They probably got sick and died later on. Or were martyred in some cases. So just because... Jesus was showing mercy and grace and touching their physical lives. Doesn't mean that was, the, that was the main reason he was there. He was there after their hearts for the eternal value of their hearts. As was always the case, as is always the case. He is after our hearts. He's after yours and mine. 
And that was the second thing that got revealed to me. As I've been reading through Scripture, I have my daily devotionals, and then as I studied and so forth, it's easy to slip into the mode of, I've done that. I've read my Bible today. I've done good. I move on. Rather than sitting at Jesus' feet and truly taking in the bread of life. Again, because life gets busy, it's easy to quickly read through the scripture. Not that I don't gain from it, but at the same time, sometimes I find myself just reading through the scripture. And there are moments when I stop and think, okay, what did I just read? And I have to look back, oh yeah, I read in Psalm 55, that's right. That was a good psalm. And then I move on. Such a sheep I am. Have the, have the attention span of a sheep. But God calls us to much more, to a much deeper relationship with him. And really, really, as we were going through our Sunday school lesson, scriptures like this not only show God's grace and his love and his mercy, because it is reaching out to us today, but also should make us stop and do a self-check. Lord, am I truly sitting at your feet? Am I truly gaining the bread of life? Am I truly being filled until I'm satisfied with you? Lord, or do I just take a little snippet of bread and, and kind of move on? Take what I need for the moment and move on. We are called to pray unceasingly. That indicates not that we should spend all of our time on our knees, necessarily, but that we should stay in constant contact with Jesus. That we should stay in constant contact with God throughout the day. Include him in on every moment of every day. But before you could have a relationship with Christ, you need to accept what he did for you. How he lived a perfect life, as we sang in that song. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Have we accepted, have you accepted, what Jesus did for you today? And if you have, what is your relationship with Christ like? Again, it's we are people. We falter. We waver. Day in and day out, it's never the same. Thankfully, our God is the same. And we can rest in him and know that the same God who was concerned about the people being hungry and fainting on the way home is still the same God we serve and is concerned about you every moment of every day. And you can bring every concern to Christ every moment of every day. In Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 13, it says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call, up, call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And salvation is not just that act of going to the altar and, and making the, the altar call confession of faith. Not to pick on that, but at the same time, that's not the, that's not the end. That is just you walking through the door. Salvation encompasses your relationship with Christ throughout your entire life, what we call sanctification. The first part is what we call justification. You are justified before God. He has granted you forgiveness and entrance into his kingdom. The rest is of salvation is walking with him daily as he conforms you more and more into his image. 
The last part of salvation is where we are glorified. That's where we get our glorified bodies. We go to be with him for eternity. We no longer have to struggle here. So this thought of salvation, again, is more than just saying you believe in Christ. It is walking with Christ. It's trusting in him. It's resting in him. It's knowing him more every day. And like me, take a moment to reflect. Am I just sometimes after God for the, the loaf of bread that I can get? Or am I de- indeed feasting upon the true bread of life? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you again for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for your conviction, for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, that... You are the bread of life, that we can feed upon you constantly. Not only be satisfied, but be strengthened and grow and know you more. I pray that you would renew our minds, strengthen our hearts, make us more like you every day. We love you, Lord Jesus. Praise your name. Amen.